Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode. The Psychology Student here for you. Today's topic, we're gonna to be talking about the psychology of kids. Now, it won't be very biologically related, so that's more like the neuropsychology of it. This is just gonna be a surface level talk, really kind of a philosophical and psychological perspective of children and their development. So children, we're gonna go a little bit into the teens, so 12, 13, 14, but these are some things that I think everybody should know just to be aware of whether you have a child, a son, a daughter, a niece, a nephew, a younger cousin, and you were a child once too. So as we speak about these things, you can think about how people treated you, your takeaways from things, and you're gonna think, oh, that's why so-and-so did that, or that's why this felt so great, and I remember my ninth birthday so well. That's the point of this video, folks. Thank you so much for joining me. So let's talk about child development and child psychology. It would be an understatement to say that we change a lot from being a kid to becoming an adult. There are a plethora of things that happen, one of the big ones being puberty, the development of organs, um, both physically we develop and also psychologically. Our brain literally develops, there's certain areas that develop. Our frontal lobe, for example, the part of the brain responsible for decision making and judgments and logical thinking, that doesn't develop until about our mid-twenties. That's one of the reasons that we push things off like allowing someone to vote or buying a gun. I understand those are early twenties or how early can you buy a gun in the States? Is it 21? Is it 18? I gotta look into it. Regardless, there are some pretty big milestones for kids as they are growing up, and we cannot overstate the importance of the parental role as this kid's developing. And the difference between a kid who develops with what we would typically call a healthy relationship with their parents, with a guardian of source, versus an unhealthy one. One filled with neglect and anxiety issues, abuse. So unfortunately, there is the negative sides of it too. One of the, the really interesting things is when you identify beauty, you simultaneously identify the ugly. What I mean by that is the moment I say, hey, a healthy relationship is blank, anyone who doesn't have a healthy relationship, it, it's impossible to miss. Like it's just going to stand out that much more. And when I say healthy relationship, I'm not saying a mother or father and everyone's relationship has to be this one specific way. Not at all. But generally speaking, we do see some common patterns of children who grow up and who have better psychosocial development, meaning the way that they think about problems, their success in their career, their ability to maintain and develop meaningful relationships. These are strongly impacted by their parents, by their parental influences. When you want to look at psychology and the development of an individual, not to mention a child, there's two big things that always come to mind. Nature and nurture. For people in academia, this is something you've heard of a thousand times. For people who might not be very familiar, nature versus nurture argument is basically this. Why are you the way you are? Is it A, because of nature, meaning natural things, your genetics, your personality traits? Or is it B, nurture? Is it your environment? Are you the way you are because of your parents? Are you the way you are because of the school that you went to and the way you got bullied? Now, most people would say it's a little bit of both. Is it 50-50? That's for you to decide. But we want to look at a, a child and as they grow and as they learn, we understand the importance of parents because when you're a parent, you are the first role model in a kid's life. One of the things that Sigmund Freud, one of the greatest, in my opinion, thinkers of his time talked about was said, look, when kids see stuff from their parents, it, it leaves an impression on them. He was one of the first people to say, look, I've got, and the majority of Freud's clients were actually female. He said, I regularly speak with 25, 26, 27 year old women who are maybe sexually harassed, sexually assaulted when they were much younger, 9, 10, and 11. And he said, people carry that stuff with them, like a backpack full of rocks. You don't just forget memories. He believed you repress them, you push it down so you don't think about it. Now, as you're a child, you're going to notice different things. You're going to learn. You're going to experiment. You're going to explore. And it's the combination of it is so important for a child to try to explore the world around them. We know with there's a plethora of empirical data to show that the first way that a baby explores is with what? The first thing that they use is their mouth. If you notice, it's not on accident. It's not a coincidence that the baby uses its mouth to latch onto the nipple for uh, food in the very, very beginning, and then every toy, everything you give to it, it puts it in its mouth. Why? At that very, very young age, the place that has the greatest amount of senses to understand and to feel is the mouth. 
So it's actually completely normal that you have a very, very, very young child. I mean, we're talking baby, we're talking infant. You give it a piece of food, you give it a toy, you give it something. The first thing it does is put it in its mouth. The same way that an adult will grab something in its hands, feel it, squeeze it. Is it firm? Does it feel rubbery? What's the texture like? Is it soft? Is it smooth? That's what a baby does with its mouth. And as it grows up, it begins to learn different things. What does it taste like? Does it taste sweet? Does it taste sour? Does it taste bitter? And then that starts to transition. And then you start looking at crawling. And then you start looking at walking and just really interacting with the world around you. And then if you want to get to the brain stuff a little bit, there's a really cool spot. I would like to say around, I want to say th three years old, but it might even be earlier, where depth perception starts to come in. This is really funny because if when you're a baby and you don't have depth perception yet, what that means is if, if your baby is sitting on the ground looking at you and let's say you're standing behind a counter, they don't understand that there's like a counter in front of them and you're standing behind the counter. You just look like a floating torso. Like their brain cannot understand that you're behind something or if you're in front of something, like you're just floating. Like there's just half of you floating. You don't have legs for like a second. And then as you walk past the counter, whoa, your legs magically appear. Right? So we have these cool sort of brain developmental milestones that happen along the way. And this is obviously not exaggerated, but it's the same idea that happens with their eyes, with their fingertips, their touch, and their ability to grab, to grip things. You give a baby something, first they'll put it in their mouth. As they get a little bit older, you'll see they like to push and pull and they're really using all their uh, mechanics, all their motor controls, because a lot of these things are new. Why do kids run when, as soon as they can like get past the crawling stage? Dude, they've got no idea what running is. And the first thing that they want to do in their mind is they want to explore. Explore the environment. What can I do? What can't I do? Here's where mom and dad play a role. Mom and dad play a giant role of establishing what is and what is not okay. Sigmund Freud believed you do the most influence to a child before the age of six. From zero to six, his mindset was that's the most important for a kid. Now. Mind you, things are different now. I don't know how much data there is backing up that specific number. But it really emphasizes the importance of, look, these kids remember things. And if your child is three, four, five years old, and maybe you're a more lenient child, maybe you're a more relaxed child, that will undoubtedly influence them when they start hitting the ages of 9, 10, 11, 12, or vice versa if you're a really a strict parent. So it's important to understand when you're mom, when you are dad, you are the first barrier of what is and what is not okay. Generally speaking, the role of parents were always as a personal trainer, as the training wheels on a bicycle. You want to prepare this young man, this young woman, this, this child of yours to be able to go out into the world and succeed. Whatever succeed means to you, whether it's own a career, have meaningful relationships, have a family of their own, be able to protect themselves, be able to protect others, give back to their community, whatever that may be. One fantastic quote whenever it comes to children is, don't do something for a child that the child can do for themselves. Now that doesn't mean be selfish and don't look out for them and don't cook for them. But when you start seeing them getting older and they start getting better at things and they're at that level where they can try tying their shoes even though it's hard and they can try cooking even though they're going to fail, let them try. And the reason behind that is if you keep doing things for an individual, they will become dependent. There is not a problem for you cooking and taking care of your kid when they're 10 years old. But when you're 30, the general idea is you want them to be able to stand on their own two feet. It's that classic idea of do you want to give someone a fish every day or do you want to teach them how to fish? and they can take care of themselves, and they can go take care of other people. So that should be a thing that we have in, a, in the back of our minds is, we want this person to one day become independent and stand on their own two feet. Again, some families maybe take this to an, to an extreme. And at 12, 11, 10 years old, they, live the kid, they leave the kid at home by themselves. And maybe they give them more autonomy than you or I would think is appropriate. But again, this is a very sensitive subject because Whenever you start telling someone else, hey, this is how you should parent your kid, that's, it's rough. It's really rough because who, who am I to tell you how it should be done? And if you think this is Daniel telling you how to parent your son or daughter or niece or nephew or cousin, that is not it at all, my friends. I'm just putting out some general information that you can keep in mind. You can agree with it. You can disagree with it. But at the very least, you should entertain it and keep it in the back of your mind. 
add it to your toolkit, your arsenal of different concepts and ideas. And again, you determine the worth and the value of these words that I'm putting out here for you. So we've established the importance of parents laying down the law and saying, look, this is what's okay, this is what's not okay. If you live in the West right now, we're in a very, you know, open-minded, that's the stereotype, especially in Canada, is the parents are really relaxed, they're really chill, their 14-year-old son or daughter is out um, until 3 in the morning, their parents don't know where they are, Not again, this is just like a stereotype of sorts. And that has some benefits of, oh, the child doesn't face any stress from the parents. You know, they're not the helicopter parents looking over them, telling them every single thing that they should do. But on the contrast of that, when you are maybe a little too relaxed, when you're maybe a little too laid back, the idea is, well, what's the difference between a parent and a friend? Because if your son or daughter is like 10 and they have a friend that's 10 and you're like, well, I'm my son's friend. I'm not their dad or I'm not their mom. I'm just their friend. There are certain obligations that we would generally say that a parent might have that a friend doesn't have. And I'm trying to be really careful as I'm saying this because parenting is so different. There's so many different styles. And you have to determine your level of strictness and lenientness and relaxedness. That's up to you to decide. But it's also important to recognize that down and over in the East, normally the Middle East, Asia, we typically see a lot more strict parents, what we would call helicopter parents. These are the parents who might have strict deadlines about when the kid should come home. These are strict conditions about, you know, my kid has to be a musician. They have to play piano and they have to go to sports once a week and they have to do something else once a week and they can burden their kids a lot. Now, the pro of that is, look, if you ask a lot of an individual, chances are they're going to hit a lot of those, if not most of them. The negative is putting an excess amount of burden on a person whose brain is still development developing could have unintended consequence that could build up over time. So maybe at 14 years old, you put your kid in piano lessons and soccer classes and he has to get A's every day, B's are not okay, and there's not that much encouragement. Now that 14 year old turns 16, 17, that's why in my opinion, we see a boomerang effect with a lot of kids who are pushed so hard, so emphatically, either in a religious way or in another way, some kids, they do a complete 180. And it's, I don't know what you want to call it, burnout, uh, boomerang effect, but it's this twist of, oh, you want me to get A's? I'm not even going to go to school anymore. I'm just going to drop sports completely. And we see the opposite. The literature would tell us this. The most successful parenting is by far being kind and having high standards. I mean, there's many different words for it, but it's if you're too strict, you're going to put a lot of stress on, on the young guy or young girl's plate. If you're too relaxed, it's like, look, this kid needs some direction in their life. What most studies would find is parents who ask highly of their kid, who go, look, I want you to do well in school. I want you to do well in sports. I want you to do well in what you're doing. And if they go out and if they come back with a not so great grade or they don't do too well in their sport, guess what? They're not disciplined, but they're greeted with a hug. They're greeted with kindness, with encouragement. Hey, it's okay. You went out there, you tried your best, and look, you learned something new about yourself. Today just wasn't your day. Let's work together so then next time we can do a little bit better. So it's this beautiful idea of installing confidence in the kid and saying, I believe in you, you can do it, combined with kindness, empathy, love. I want you to try your best. Jump as high as you can. And if they fall, and they inevitably will, you'll be there with them. And you're going to hug them, and you're going to pat their back, and you're going to say, it's okay. If you would like to try again, I'm right with you. I like to give an example. I was at the swimming pool the other day, and there's this little girl, maybe four years old, maybe even younger, maybe three. And she has, she's got like these, what do you call it? Like, I don't know, the floaty wings, you know, like on the biceps. She's about to jump off the springboard. And it's about a meter away from the water like that's the distance down and what's really interesting is the girl's super excited she gets on and as she gets closer to the end of the spring where she starts looking down and you can see her eyes get really big and panic starts to set in and I just thought it was so symbolic and so beautiful of life because as children explore they find out what is safe and what isn't safe and if we take that child as a young adult now who's let's say 25 
Jumping off a springboard into the water is a lot like transitioning in a, in, into another period of our lives. When you graduate from high school, when you graduate from university or college, when you go into a relationship, when you become a father, these are all transitional periods. And oftentimes I love the symbolic of jumping off because it's not, you don't walk into it, right? It's a jump. Sometimes you don't know if you're going to land with both feet. You don't know if you're going to get water up your nose. You don't know how deep the water it is. You don't know what the temperature of the water is, but you jump anyway with all these unanswered questions. And I just thought that was so cool. Anyways, this girl's on the springboard and as she's debating, do I jump? Do I not jump? Her dad gets in the water and he's not right under the springboard, but he's about half a meter away. And it was this beautiful, beautiful analogy of, look, in life as a parent, he is nailing it on the head in terms of, I'm here. I'm with you. I'm going to help you out. You jump in. I believe you. I know you can do it. And I'll be right here. The reason why I loved that was it wasn't a helicopter parent. It wasn't, no, oh my God, my kid, you can't jump off the springboard. You're going to die. You're going to do this. He wasn't freaking the kid out. He wasn't saying, look, I'm going to hold you the entire time. We're going to jump off together. But he didn't have his back face to the kid either. It wasn't like the kid was jumping in the springboard and the dad was just looking away, being super oblivious. He was in the water, but he had the right amount of distance to push her autonomy, to push her courageousness. And yet he was there to greet her with kindness and with support. Guess what happens? She jumps in the water. Her head goes under. Dad is really, really close. As soon as her head comes out of the water, what's the first face that she sees? Dad. And he's smiling and he's looking at her. And even if the girl was scared and doesn't know what's happening, if the dad's first reaction is, oh my God, are you okay? Are you all right? What do you think that does to the kid? So when the kid comes out of the water by themselves and the dad hasn't even touched them, he's in arm's reach because he's a dad and he's protective, but he doesn't lay a finger on her. When she comes up, and she sees his face smiling and there's that level of autonomy and accomplishment in a four-year-old. You want to talk about having a confident kid? When that four-year-old turns eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 22, my friends, that's how it happens. We find the middle ground between not being extremely overprotective versus not having our back turned. You can do it. I believe in you. I'm going to be right beside you. Give it a try. One small problem that we might face in this kind of participation era that we're in, you know, everyone gets a trophy, everyone's a winner. Well, the problem with that is your son or daughter or your child or your niece or nephew, they're going to fail at things in life. They're going to apply for a job and not get it. They're going to ask someone out and get rejected. Certain things aren't going to go their way. And one of the beauties of winning and losing, especially in like sports games and things of that nature is as a dad, as a mom, you get to put your hand on their back and go, hey, it's okay, champ. You know, you did your best. Or maybe, look, man, you didn't look like yourself out there. You looked a little tired. What do you think happened? And he says, yeah, dad, like, I, I don't know. I don't feel too good. You know, I'm not happy. Like, I, that sucked. I did not enjoy that. I just want to go home. And in your thought, it's like, awesome. Sit with that feeling. Sit with that feeling. It, it sucks. But it's a part of life and it's inescapable. So what we do at a young age is we, we expose you to that feeling. And dad or mom is going to pat you on the back. And go, look, champ, I don't, I don't think you look too great either. What do you think you can do next time so maybe it goes a little bit better? So when we take losing out, what we simultaneously do is we take out the need for that discussion. So when that 8, 12, 15 year old hasn't had that discussion about a result not going his or her way, now when they're 19, 20, they apply for a job right out of university or excuse me, right out of high school and they don't get it. It hurts. Why? Because they haven't been exposed to that feeling. I've said the same thing about getting rejected and the beauty of rejections because what happens over time is you build a tolerance to it. Imagine someone who never applies for anything. And then all of a sudden they're 25, they apply, they get rejected and they get crippled. Why? Because they've never been exposed to that feeling. Not to mention uh, only losing, but also winning. When your son goes and they win and their team crushes the other team, you have to have that idea of, look kid, you don't have to be a sore winner. You won, but there's no need to ridicule them. There's no need to poke fun at them. You don't have to make jokes. You keep your chin up. You go, you shake every single one of their hands and you walk away. You are no better than they are. 
That was just the result today. It might have been different tomorrow or the day after that. But again, if we add in that participation idea, we take out the conversations for sore winners because everyone's a winner. So we understand the importance of the role of parents when it comes to winning, when it comes to losing, when it comes to exposing children to, to things that might not make them feel very comfortable. And the idea is, look, you're never going to lose in life. The idea is, it's going to happen, inevitably. But when it does, it's going to be okay. Because I'm here with you. And as a parent, it is my job to provide you with love, with confidence, but to be honest with you about the dangers of the world. Not to put you in a bubble and protect you and tell you the world is a beautiful place. Because it's not. And I don't want to make you anxious and make you paranoid. But I want to be honest. And again, as you grow up, these conversations are going to be different about how much information you expose them to. But the literature right now suggests exactly what I'm saying. It's that medium ground between love and kindness and gentleness and support. And I'm there for you, bud. And go out and do it. Try your best. Why someone else? Why not you? Why can't you get the A? Why can't you be the best player on your team? I believe in you. Give it a try. You can do it. Give it a try. I'll support you. I'll be at the game. And if we raise our kids, our little ones, with that sort of a mentality, we encourage them to explore and interact with the world around them. And in case they need us, they can always look back and we are right there. That way, I don't have to hold your hand. I don't have to pick you up and, and, and help you interact with the world. But I'm not ignorant either. I'm not looking away. I'm not, you know, I tell you, all right, bud, go explore, and then I, I leave. I'm right there. And it's that beautiful balance of support and autonomy. And when you reach that, my friends, if you want to have a child who is extremely confident, who is secure, who has high self-esteem, look, there's a lot more I can talk about. This is a, a short episode, but that's really one of the fundamentals. And if there's one thing you want to take away when you think about children and installing confidence in them, it's that. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. This has been Daniel, another episode. Take care, folks, and stay safe. Bye-bye.